Section 13 of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, Part 4 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Payrolls The cost of handling this large business necessarily varies from week to week, as the number of families asking for aid increases or diminishes. The payrolls for the week ending November 18th may be taken as a fair average of present expenditure. That for the 6th District, which is the rural portion of Cook County, outside the city limits, is not included in this table, as that report for the week was not received in season. That, however, is comparatively insignificant, as the number of persons needing aid there is small. Neither are the expenditures of the Shelter Committee in the business of their Bureau included, as that is properly charged to a separate account, which must be closed in a few days or weeks, and should not be included in the current expenses of the Society, which will continue through the winter. The clerical force employed by that Committee is large, but temporary only. Payrolls for the week ending November 18th District 1 142 persons employed, amount $1,549. District 2, persons employed, 116, amount $1,190.17. District 3, persons employed, 106, amount $1,347.75. District 4, persons employed 50, amount $531.82. District 5, persons employed 75, amount $855.66. Special Bureau, persons employed 9, amount $118.50. Superintendent salaries, $225.00. Warehousemen receiving storing and delivering supplies, 111 persons employed, amount $1,259.87. Transportation, $2,148.87. Total for distribution, $9,226.64. Two persons employed, thirty-six dollars. Clerks in offices of Treasurer, Auditor, Transportation Committee, Purchasing Committee, and Executive Committee, thirty-two persons employed, four hundred and ninety-six dollars and thirty-four cents. Total general business, nine thousand seven hundred and fifty-eight dollars and ninety-eight cents. The Bureau of Special Relief. No branch of the work has given the committee so much anxiety and perplexity as that which has come to be known as the Bureau of Special Relief. Among the sufferers by the fire is a large class of persons who, it was soon apparent, would not be reached by the established method of relief, but who were the least accustomed to deprivation and hardship. They shrank from an exposure of their poverty, though it was no fault of their own, and, though sufferers in common with tens of thousands of others, from a great public calamity, they would perish rather than appear as the recipients of public bounty. If they were to be helped at all, they must be helped in some special way. It was no time to stop and consider whether the feeling was altogether reasonable or not. It was painfully evident that a want existed, growing out of previous conditions in life of the sufferers, and public opinion, as well as private feeling, made it necessary to devise some way to meet it. It was believed that the personal and confidential relations between pastor and people, and between the officers and members of benevolent and fraternal societies, would reveal a great many cases of this sort, and many, it was thought, would ask aid for themselves if encouraged to do so by being permitted to seek relief where publicity could be avoided, and the shock be lessened to their sensitiveness and reserve. Moved by these considerations, the committee invoked the aid and counsel of clergymen, 
and the representatives of the societies just referred to. By the establishment of a bureau to be devoted exclusively to special relief, and to be under the control of a committee appointed by this body of our fellow citizens, it was proposed to bring into line all effort on behalf of the unfortunate, that none should be left to perish for want of sympathy and help. Most of those whose aid was invoked entered heartily into the work, and with a sincere desire to lighten the general labors of the society. Perhaps it was too much to expect, even in a cause involving only the single purpose of feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, that the plan should succeed in satisfying all those who sought to make use of the means in the hands of the society. It is by no means easy to say always where the obligations of those entrusted with the delicate task of deciding between the claims of different classes begin or where they end. And the most careful judgment, and the most even justice, will not save their decisions from sometimes seeming invidious. But nevertheless, since the special bureau, E. C. Learned Chairman, was opened at the Church of the Messiah, its usefulness has become daily more and more manifest, and more and more appreciated. Mr. Larned has been assisted by Rev. Laird Collier, B. G. Caulfield, Rev. E. P. Goodwin, Lewis Wall, G. R. Chittenden, Orrington Lunt, Mrs. Joseph Medill, Mrs. David A. Gage, and Mrs. J. E. Tyler, all of whom give their time without compensation. Up to the twenty-fifth instant, aid has been given to one thousand five hundred and twenty-five families. Very few, if any, of these had previously sought for relief through the ordinary channels, and would, no doubt, some from pride, and some from inability through sickness or infirmity, have suffered the very extremity of distress before they would or could have looked for succor in that direction. While great care is taken that there shall be from its stores no duplication of supplies from other distributing points, all applications are received and considered with all the delicacy and reserve that the nature of the business admits of, and there can be no doubt that it has relieved the wants of thousands who would otherwise have been left uncared for, or dependent upon the chance charity of those who should happen to know of their condition. One of its methods of relief, especially, has saved many worthy women from penury and despair, by putting into their hands the means of immediate and comfortable subsistence. Arrangements have been made with all the principal manufacturers of sewing machines, by which they generously agreed to accept a large discount on the usual price of a single machine. A payment of twenty dollars is made as the first installment on that price and one hundred and thirty-two machines have thus been purchased, and given to that number of deserving women, who brought satisfactory evidence that they had been sufferers by the fire. So many are reinstated, and many more will be in the same way, in their former means of earning a livelihood. CHARITABLE INSTITUTIONS The support which has hitherto been given to the permanent charitable institutions of the city, has been swallowed up in the greater calamity which has thrown nearly a third of our people upon the charity of the world. But while their ordinary resources are thus taken away, the necessity for help for the particular classes under their care is greater than ever. The Relief Society feel that they would have failed in a complete discharge of the duties imposed upon them by the trust put into their hands, if they failed to recognize the claims of these special charities, the Committee on Charitable Institutions, N. S. Boughton, Chairman, have extended aid, therefore, to the following institutions. The Home for the Friendless, the Protestant Orphan Home, the St. Joseph Asylum for Orphans, the Old Ladies Home, the House of the Good Shepherd, the Foundlings Home, the Half Orphans Home. To all of these institutions a monthly allowance in money is given, and those which have been burned out have been supplied in addition with food, clothing, bedding, and stores sufficient for their immediate necessities. Still further aid will be extended to them all, if it shall be found requisite to carry them through the winter. There were other institutions of a similar character, which were destroyed and their inmates dispersed. 
these have not yet provided themselves with permanent residences, and the committee do not feel justified by the means at their disposal to advance the large sums that would be required for their re-establishment, they can only undertake to supplement in some measure to those whose responsibilities are still existent, the resources of which they are deprived by the general disaster. The sailor's home only was made an exception to this rule. Though that institution lost its house by the fire, the inmates were kept together, and the shelter committee has offered to put up a temporary building for them at a cost not to exceed $5,000. End of section 13